All right. So yes, like Shree mentioned, my name is Brian Cathy, and I work at Discover Financial Services. And the theme of my presentation today is behind the music, security automation. Uh, I was excited to hear that there was a music theme to the presentations. Um, I'm a big fan of music myself. So I tried to bleed that in a little bit throughout the slides. Uh, to get through the fun part first, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention something my corporate communications team so nicely recommended I bring up. Uh, the opinions expressed in this presentation are that of my own and not necessarily that of Discover's, uh, now that we're through the technical part of the presentation. A little bit about my experience as a Cortex customer. Uh, I am a recent Cortex customer, about as recent as the acquisition of Demisto by Cortex. And so far, the experience I have had has been wonderful. We're seeing a lot of new developments coming through the security orchestration suite uh, now that Demisto has been acquired by Palo Alto Cortex. And I'm excited to see where it goes from here. I did just learn last night that the name is changing, though. So that was a curveball. Uh, so XOR will probably not be mentioned as much as Demisto in this presentation. I'm sorry, marketing. Uh, <laughs> A brief overview of myself and my experience. I have worked for Discover for a few years, going on about five. I spent three and a half or four of those years working as a security operations analyst. I worked with our forensics teams and our 24-7, 365 monitoring center, uh, making sure all of our customer data was safe. Uh, it was a very high-paced job, as it was alluded to many times today. The work was never in short supply. Uh, that is my background. The overview I wanted to give on the presentation and the music theme, behind the music, the old VH1 show, if people remembered it, about rock bands and how they got formed and their background. When I was thinking about my team and its history with security automation, that was the first thing that came to my mind. Uh, making security automation is essentially taking a bunch of noise and putting it together into music. Uh, it's security, though, so it's probably a little bit less like a symphony, a little bit more like a rock band, at least in my perspective. So. That is the inspiration for that theme. Some background on Discover Financial Services as a customer of Palo Alto and all the other products that we purchase. Uh, we are a large financial institution. I know most people think of us for our Discover It card. Uh, we're a full service bank as well, deposit accounts, CDs, everything of that nature. We're an international card provider. We are an international payment network. We operate in a lot of countries. Uh, so what that means is one, there's high stakes in the data that we protect. We have threat actors motivated by all of the key elements they would be motivated by, uh, financial, political, uh, terrorism, you name it. Uh, we have ex expanded visibility and high scope of our security operations. We have a lot of regulators. We have a lot of things that we have to do. We have a lot of things that are right to do. We have a lot of things that we want to do for our customers. So put that all together, and we have a very low tolerance for failure at the program level. So when you hear about how we do some of the things that we do throughout this presentation, I want you to have that context. That's, this is the motivation for us having the teams that we have in the places that we have them. So I myself personally, I don't run the security program at Discover. I run the security automation program. And when I tell that to a lot of people that work in security, I a lot of times get the question, why an entire team dedicated to just security automation? Isn't that just a component of security? Well, like we just talked about, we have a lot of high-stake threats and visibility. And those threat actors, they never rest. So the security team, like the one I was on previously, the SOC and the forensics team, they don't get to rest either. They don't get to stop and say, well, I want to develop this, this security automation program or product to make my job better, make it more efficient. So I'm just going to hit pause. I'm going to take a break. Uh, I'm sure the bad guys will understand, right? And they'll stop trying to siphon money out of accounts and things like that. Um, no, that doesn't happen. So there's also the maintenance side of it. You don't have the chance to take a break and build it. You also don't necessarily have the resources in your cybersecurity department to maintain it. It is a lot to maintain. You talk about just the platform itself. That's architecture. It's networking. It's things that need to run all the time. And there's also content. You're building playbooks, you're building automations, you're writing code that connects to other systems. Things change, dependencies change. Somebody has to be on top of that. Uh, it's hard enough as it is to tell these teams, these security operations teams, to do more of what they're already doing, let alone add all of this on top of it. Uh, so my team is a group of professionals that felt very strongly about the, the vision of security automation, had the means, the understanding, and the, the technical skills to do so, 
and our leadership at Discover decided that the initiative was worthwhile having an entire team dedic to it, dedicated to it, which I'm very fortunate for. I think it's a very good approach to the problem. So back to the theme of uh, behind the music. When our band was forming, the early years, we were just a bunch of security professionals in different areas of the company, right? I was in security operations. One of my analysts worked all across information systems and different infosec departments. Uh, we had people working on high-end advanced cloud development. Uh, so we kind of came from a, a diverse background. This allowed us to refine skills in a lot of different areas, in those different spaces that our security teams needed some assistance working in remediating act, uh, activities and things like that. Uh, moving forward, when our leadership decided they wanted to take a stab at this whole security orchestration and automation thing, they didn't know how. So what they did was they kind of held an audition, right? Typical POC. They knew that they were going to target uh, Demisto for the POC, but what they didn't know is who, they, who was going to do it. How was it going to happen? Uh, so they put our band together as like a temporary focus group, and we made an automation that I'll talk about in a little bit that worked out really well. People liked what they heard, and they asked us to continue doing it and make more of it. Uh, so as we formed, we got the right people involved we started making music. It was really disruptive, and our leadership liked it. They asked us to double down. Moving forward, we're building momentum this year. Now we've got a team. We've got at least three senior engineers on our team right now. We're expanding up to at least five in this current year, and we are going to double down on this initiative. Uh, we want to keep the hits coming. This wonderful uh, corporate presentation slide here that looks like a system development life cycle is pretty much exactly that. Uh, just a little bit tweaked for how we approach making security orchestration and automation as a product for our teams internally. Uh, you know, we're an agile delivery team like every company is these days. They, they focus on their own slice of agile. But what I will point out on this slide, I'm not going to go too deep into it, is when you're making security orchestration products for teams, different than a, some of the other technical products you might make for teams, you really need to live in spaces one and two, the requirements and the refinement of user requests. We probably spend 60% of our time initially making sure we truly understand the use case and the work requested of us. People come to us and they'll say, I don't like working phishing emails. Make it go away. Or, Automate it, right? Just get rid of it. Uh, that's not really a refined use case. I want to understand their workflow. I want to understand what they do to get their data, how they action that data, what they think is fishy. And we need to understand that well so that we build them automation that's scalable and actually useful. So you can make automation, or you can make automation that rocks. And to do that, we thought, we don't want to just automate away use cases. Like I said before, don't tell me that you want to not have to work phishing anymore. We want to make a security orchestration and response suite of utilities for these security teams in the company. I don't really care if they're focused on SOC analyst work or data loss prevention work or forensic work. I want to make a suite of utilities that I know that they all use for the common good of protecting our company and make them as approachable and useful as possible. So the way we do that is we focus on developing for these use cases that people come to us asking to automate in kind of a three-prong approach. We, I chose the terminology because of the terminology Demisto uses, integrations, automations, and uh, playbooks. So in the first step, whenever we're starting to build a use case out for someone, we have to integrate systems to, in this case, Demisto, right? Uh, so we could just... There's a lot of off-the-shelf integrations on the platform. They're great. We use those when they exist and when, when they work for our needs. Sometimes what we're trying to integrate is a custom in-house application that there couldn't possibly be an out-of-the-box solution for, and everything in between. Sometimes the out-of-the-box solution just is missing a key component or two, and we wanted to add a little bit of flair to it. But no matter what you're integrating, you need to consider why for the current use case, but also what opportunities does this integration have for other use cases throughout the organization. Um, a good example of that was integrating with ServiceNow. Uh, ServiceNow has an integration. It didn't exactly have everything we needed for it, the use case we were looking at at the time. So when we decided to expand on that internally, 
uh, we were like, okay, well, what else could we add to this integration that would make it more useful? Instead of just what we need for this use case. We know there's other customers in the organizations, we know they all use this platform. So make your integrations with that in mind. These are your Lego blocks that you're gonna be able to use to build all other kinds of automations down the road. So once you integrate Demisto to your technologies at your organizations, when you want to automate things, you don't want to go for the biggest, heaviest hitting piece right away, right? We always look at the playbook that, you know, the dream state that people want created, you know, working phishing analysis, and we take that understanding that we've developed of their workflow and say, okay, well, what are the questions that the analyst looks to answer? So one of our use cases for the data loss prevention team we actually did the refinement by breaking it down into 10 questions that they aim to answer every time that they work these incidents. It won't always be a clean number like 10, uh, but taking those 10 questions, we were able to say, okay, with the integrations we have, can I answer these questions for this analyst? I don't care how, whether it's a sub-playbook, an automation, a full-fledged playbook, or a scheduled job, but these are the questions I need to answer. My customer wants those answered. Sometimes it's as easy as, well, we need to know if this, this end user can access this file. That's, that's all they need to know. I don't really care how they, how they do it, right? We, we went one way to do it. There's probably five other ways to do it. Uh, but answering the question is the most important part. And that's your little automations. And then you bring them all together. You orchestrate you know, your, your investigation and your response via playbooks, sub-playbooks, automation uh, jobs. And you know, this is where you get to have your fun, right? This is definitely the most amusing part to see at the end of the day, your metrics, where you're like, I've had 5,000 playbooks run and they remediated 500 incidents. And you know, that's great, but you can't do that successfully, or maybe you could in a single use case, but it would be a lot more efficient if you consider integrations and automations along the way as key components of a source suite. Don't look at it as my administration said we are going to reduce the cost of working phishing incidents, so I'm gonna buy Demisto to fix my phishing problem. So our first hit on my team was, like most teams, a phishing analysis playbook. And we thought about what to tackle first, and it seemed a little bit redundant to go after phishing, but as soon as we started working on a phishing playbook in our POC, uh, we figured this is probably gonna be very easy, there's out-of-the-box playbooks for this, Everybody's worked fishing, they, they get it, so this shouldn't be a big challenge. It was definitely challenging, though. Um, everybody works fishing differently because they have different threat actors targeting them. They have different customers, they have different internal systems that these threat actors are going after. So off the shelf wasn't gonna work for us, not right away. We knew that right out the gate. It quickly blew up into one of the largest playbooks that many of the vendors and uh, other customers of Demisto I've ever shown it to has seen. Uh, we had a meetup in Chicago with other Demisto uh, partners and talked about the size of it, and I was thinking that it was going to be pretty, pretty standard until I started talking to people about how, how large their playbooks typically are. This, this playbook has well over 100 tasks, and over a dozen integrations to internal and external systems, and dozens of logic checks that I, it's really expanded since I was working on it. It's now in the hands of our internal customer, the SOC, the security operations team, but it's amazing seeing what they've done with it. Uh, it saved them over 1,500 analyst hours in the first set of metrics that we took back in the December, I believe it was. So that's 1,500 analyst hours for an advanced cybersecurity firm such as Discover in a single use case, our first stab through the POC. I was very proud of that. Um, some highlights surrounding that. Our, we have a large-scale data enrichment section for this playbook. Like I said, it connects to a lot of things. It gets a lot of data and it does a lot of decisions around it. This is long. I, we had to go back multiple times and say, we're not doing this right. We're not making this efficient. Why is this so slow? So you have to be careful with that. Start, you know, utilize sub-playbooks, utilize those automations, answer the questions. Don't say, I have the tools, so I'm just gonna, I have the hammer, so I'm gonna hit something with it. Don't do that. Start thinking about, okay, well, but what do I need to build? All right, I wanna build a house, so maybe I don't just wanna hit things with a hammer. Um, and these metrics that we're getting from the platform they're in their early stages for us because we didn't really consider it as a metrics gathering platform right out the gate. We knew it was a possibility, but if anything, and you're trying to explain the possible value of a use case to someone, 
most likely the use case that you're gonna be tackling, something that's very manual, it's likely something that you don't have good insight into when it comes to metrics and data, right? How do you document what Joe did on third shift when he was half asleep and probably not paying attention? <laughs> you have to find a way to get those, those thought processes into data if you wanna be able to tell the story correctly. It's something we're still tackling. It, and I would say for anybody out there who's early in their uh, journey through SOAR or thinking about undertaking it, when you build, and we'll talk about this later, uh, build with support and build with metrics in mind. They're very powerful. Uh, just make sure you keep that in mind. It's, it's very impressive. Also, I put in here, and it was interesting to see in the opening remarks, the threat intelligence presentation, we had a very similar experience when we started doing the phishing playbook where we realized uh, SOAR can allow us to make two teams in the cybersecurity space that don't necessarily have integration collaborate together via data. And those two teams for us were our threat, uh, at least on the SOC side, was our security analysts and our, SOC, or our threat analysts. So the old model for threat intelligence via the phishing workflow, we have a threat intelligence team at Discover that focuses on all threat intel, you know, around the world that they can to model out our threat actors that are targeting us and report that vertically and help our analysts protect from them. The, when it came to phishing, the only way they ever learned anything about the actors targeting us was if the analyst documented it, wrote it up, passed that along. If they were just working it and it was a non-incident or something that didn't really come to fruition, the threat team would never know about that, but those are pieces of information that they need too, right? Those are attempts, that's actors pursuing us. So they weren't getting the whole picture. We tried to just flood that data into our threat intelligence platform. That didn't work. There's so many tens of thousands of indicators that we come across in a given day from these phishing incidents that just saying, I saw it, it was less than trustworthy, so therefore it's bad, that's a nightmare, don't do that. Um, so what we decided to do was we decided to actually, similar to what we heard in our opening remarks, before I knew this was gonna be an official product, uh, we started to take this in threat intelligence and run it through a separate set of checks and playbooks, aggregate it in a centralized location where it then gets put in the hands of our threat intelligence team. Our threat intelligence team can then parse through it like they would any other feed. This is like a feed you would pay for, but even better, it's a feed that you curated. So the data was better right out the gate. They got to go through it, sift through it, decide if they wanted to add it when they do want to add it. All they have to do is do it through the war room, do it through the playbook, hit go, and it gets uploaded. Uh, we were going to be working on future use cases for that uh, with the threat team as they matured into this space, and I'm excited to see what they come and ask my team down the road. I want to hear what threat analysts want to see out of the space of automation. So I'm excited to see that progression as well. So every band has some hit singles. It's not all about the big albums and the, the platinum records. Uh, we realize quickly that these can actually be more powerful than what you're talking about with your giant phishing use cases and your data loss prevention use cases. Uh, the proxy checker, I'm not gonna go through each of these in, in detail on this slide because I'll talk about a few of them moving forward, but the proxy checker was one that I hated so much when I was an analyst having to check to see what the true state of whether or not something would be denied on, on our proxy would be. You've got one categorization, true, like companies won't let you go to gambling websites at work. That's fine and great. But then you have blacklists, you have whitelists, you have special access groups, privileged access groups. You've got all these disparate data sources and all I wanna know is can this guy that clicked on a link even get there? if he were to somehow skirt past something, right? And that was hard to answer because these systems weren't designed with that in mind. The proxy and the whitelist system was not designed with an analyst doing research in mind. So it's an, it's an awful process at the end of the day. So it was a simple solution. We were able to use a secure account using secure access methods to go in there, check these various values, do some if-then statements, and just be able to tell the analyst yes or no. Can they do it? Yes or no? It's that easy. Uh, reduce the amount of time to do something that we did probably 20 times a day on a slow day uh, by a dramatic amount. Uh, we talked about the threat intelligence, collaboration, and integration of, of people, teams, and knowledge. Another thing that I wanted to talk about in a little bit more detail than I originally planned on after talking to Shri and team uh, about some of the themes that they get from their other customers 
is our credential checker and our identity services integration. We had an ask from the SOC and the forensics team to make automation that wasn't necessarily to reduce time and save money as much as it was to take humans out of a dangerous and sensitive process. Uh, we have a process where credentials might be brought to our investigators. They were found on the dark web. They were part of a credential dump, something of that nature. We suspect that they might be Discover employee credentials. How do we find out? Previously, they could not find a way without actually trying to log into that account and interact with those credentials and that access to definitively say if they were true or not. Now, at the end of the day, they were found. So there was always going to be some remediation and some action, but it changes things if they were accurate credentials. But they would not check because that's just bad. You don't take credentials and try them out. So the first thing we built for them was a way to securely and without ever presenting the credentials to a user, uh, test them for validity. We developed a, a special checker that checks against a separate identity store in a way that does not compromise our, our operational integrity. It cannot lock out user accounts. Uh, so that was a big thing. What if the automation goes awry? What if uh, a flood of these comes in and we start dosing our employees by locking their accounts out? Um, so it cannot do that. And it also never allows anybody to interact with the credentials. So at the end, that was a win-win. So now they can immediately see these credentials were found and they're bad. So that's a great first step. The second step was to solve this problem. And they had to page out members of an identity service provider team at our company to have them manually log in with admin credentials and change attributes on that account to make sure that it was disabled and the password was reset. That is very dangerous. We've actually seen how that can go wrong at our company, and, and I think everybody has. Anytime you have humans interacting with production admin interfaces, it's a bad time, or at least it poses the, poten the, the potential to be a bad time. So I was expecting to go to the identity service teams and have them say, you want to plug this automation fancy doohickey thing into our production systems? Scary, no way, I don't even want to talk to you about it. Move on. Uh, that was not at all the feedback that we got from that team. They were like, please, please tell me more. I don't want to have to log in as admin to this console and make this change manually. It scares me to do that. Um, so this is a not cyber team, their infrastructure, their identity services, who was begging for the cyber interaction because they didn't want to have to make these changes either. So we, we figured it out together. We found a safe alternative way to automate it, document it. We have it log into our SIM. We have alerts set up tracking this behavior. It's very, very different than the previous model. This didn't exactly save anybody time. Human analysts are still working each of these cases in the same capacity, but our blast radius and our potential for failure is significantly reduced. So think about that when you're looking at these automations moving forward. It's not always about saving time. It's not always about saving money. Sometimes it's about just limiting exposure. We'll talk about the data, prevention, data loss prevention use case now. I've mentioned that a few times. Uh, the data loss prevention use case, when it was brought to us, I, I've never worked on a data loss prevention team, so they walked me through it and I was just kind of shocked. I was like, wow. So you scan every file, you scan every email, you scan every packet in our company, and when you find sensitive data in places where it shouldn't be, and it could be something as easy as, I don't know, Joe Bob decided to write something down in OneNote because he you know, didn't want to forget it later, but that's technically against policy and it needs to be remediated. So these things get scanned, they get aggregated, it's done quarterly, and they produce these tens of thousands of records long data sets that they have to parse through, organize, filter everything manually. They were doing things in Excel, they were saving them on their laptops, and when so-and-so would go on vacation, then all were ground to a halt. And it just, I was shocked. Uh, so the, the solution was very low tech, but when we saw the impact that it could have, we were almost more excited about it than some of the really fancy, fun things that we've developed. It was gonna have a really big impact on an important security team's day-to-day -day life, and it's not necessarily the team that you hear about in the news every day, right, doing you know, hacking, hacking back and all these other fun things. Uh, data loss prevention, you know, it doesn't sound the most sexy, but if at the end of the day we have data sitting where it shouldn't be, these policies and standards were written for a reason. Every day that those don't get remediated, that's something that's you know, putting our company at risk. So the other thing, it wasn't just highly manual, it was obviously slow and inefficient. So they had to 
log into a lot of systems manually. And we thought we could also make this better. I, I thought maybe we can make them not have to log into anything else other than the Misto because it's 2020, all of our vendors have APIs. And if it's got an API, I can, we can Python it, right? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, I think everybody's had this experience where they talk to a vendor about their API or lack thereof, and they're like, oh, well, it's, they're going to tell me it's coming in next version, right? Because there's, there's no way that they're just going to give up on APIs. Like, it's a fad that's going to go away. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's possible to have a vendor that's just resistant, maybe. It's just not something that their primary or base customer set needs, and they don't think it's worth their time. When you come across that, though, the solution is just to strategically involve your analysts and do it by presenting them the most effective data in the most effective way possible. Have them put in the other part that you couldn't get automatically. So the way that worked in this use case is, and I'll talk through this uh, as I go, there was a key component of data that if they needed to action a case, they couldn't get out of this system for sensitivity reasons via API. So we've got the incident structured in a way to where everything else is put together, presented to them, and when it comes time to get that information, all they have to do is answer the question in the, in the platform by putting that data in. From there on out, everything else flows smooth as possible. I point this out because a lot of people, when we were talking about this use case, they wanted to just move on. And when we were talking about this as a Demisto use case, they're like, well, so much of our, our job requires using this platform, and it doesn't have an API, so nah, never mind. It's like, oh, so much of your job then. OK, help me understand your use case. And we talked about it. It's like, so you're, you're saying just that part where you need to get this piece of data requires that system. That doesn't mean move on and this can't help, right? That just means strategically put that data into the workflow um, in a way that makes sense. So the success that we're going to get from this use case and, and this partnership with our data loss prevention team is they're going to get a scan result parser. We've already developed most of this in partnership with them. Uh, all that huge data set that they gather quarterly is going to be put into Demisto, where it's going to be parsed, categorized, organized. It's going to make a separate case per violator, and it's going to get all the metadata to answer all 10 questions that they said they would need to answer a user inquiry. If a user then emails them and asks them a question, it's going to do keyword matching, confidence scoring, things of that nature, our own first stab at kind of uh, you know, modeling data. And it's going to say to the data loss prevention analyst, here's what I think is going on based off of the playbook. Uh, do you agree? If it agrees, great. It's going to send them canned responses, give them documentation, help them through the remediation service. If not, then the analyst has the ability to pick the right path, use all the tools that we develop for them. And at least everything's happening in Demisto, where it's able to be gathered as metrics and not via email or in so-and-so's OneNote, where nothing is trackable ever. Uh, they now get SLAs, and previously they had to take a guess because you can't really put an SLA on email. But when we asked them, well, what's your SLA currently, they said, we'd be happy to respond and have something remediated in seven days. Now, we're targeting getting that in significantly less than 24 hours. So the next things that we're excited to be working on is we want to take you know, a little bit of time in this upcoming year to make sure that we put automation in our forefront when we develop our systems. As, as a team that focuses on uh, housing Demisto and, and serving these automations to our internal customers, we want to make sure that we set ourselves up to move fast uh, to get them into the hands of our customers. So we're working on GitHub content delivery automations. Uh, this is going to allow us to do a couple of different interesting things. One of them is automated deployment of content. So we have different teams at the company. They've got dev, pre-prod, prod. prod. Uh, they want to be able to, for some things that we didn't develop for them, they want to be able to say, this is done. I want to put it to prod in a way that's you know, very similar to your typical CI, CD pipeline. Um, so we're going to make a process for that. right? They can hit go. It'll move it through a series of checks and balances via the pipeline, get it into prod with ch you know, checks and balances on our side considered. Uh, we're mer working towards a scheduled automatic rebuilds uh, of our infrastructure. I personally am not a fan of having to track vulnerability remediations, uh, you know, make sure that we do you know, a patch sometime before the 30-day SLA. Those things wouldn't exist if we just rebuilt the entire service uh, every seven days. And right now, we've been having to do it somewhat manually because of some CI-CD hiccups. But we can you know, hit go in our CI-CD pipeline and have a system stood up from 0 to 60 in 30 minutes. So that's something I'm pretty happy to expand upon. 
Another thing that I mentioned before is these non-cybersecurity or these infrastructure service uh, pipelines of work. I'm excited to see our services grow into spaces that aren't your typical SOC and forensic analyst. The data loss prevention use case was one of those. What I mentioned before with the credential checker was another one. There's no reason why this should be limited to our 24-7 our operations teams. A lot of the things that our identity services teams do, they're cybersecurity as well. They're just in the infrastructure services side. So it's going to make everyone's life better. Vulnerability management I put up on there because I've talked to a lot of people about it. It's something that everybody is looking at as like kind of the next phishing use case because there's just so many data points, so many integrations to consider. Um, so if anybody else has undergone that challenge, let me know. I'd love to talk to you about it. It's something that's on my radar for the near future. Uh, some lessons learned. We definitely had some, our, our share of good times and bad times. Uh, there were a lot of trips, some stumbles. We never fell, though, and we got to where we're going. Uh, we learned that building these automations and these playbooks is very difficult. Uh, I love the platform. I love the concept. But like I said, it's a lot to expect somebody to be able to just pick up and do. There's a lot to consider. The job itself is the same way. Well, just get a bunch of analysts together and make them work security events, right? Let's just do it 24-7. And you, how, do you, how could you get hacked then? It's not that easy, and automating it is not that easy. So you gotta, you gotta focus. Uh, you really, really need to understand the workflow and build with support in mind. The first time we got engaged on a problem for something that we built for another client, we were so happy <laughs> with how easy it was to remediate. I've uh, mentioned it before, I've got a team of people with a lot of experience throughout the uh, organization. They're really talented developers that thankfully built everything with support in mind. Documentation is key. Test cases in your code is key. All of these things set it up to where uh, one of my engineers made such good documentation that myself as the product owner, a guy who uh, you should be afraid if I'm ever tasked with uh, you know, fixing any of your code, um, I was able to fix a support incident in less than five minutes just with my team's documentation alone. And you know, so that's powerful in all spaces, but it's pretty key in this space as well. Because once you get a playbook with 12 integrations, there's five million ways it could go wrong. Just keep that in mind. Um, expectation versus reality is another thing. We're serving internal customers, much like uh, previous presentations today, talking about MSSPs and things like that. If you service others, you need to talk to them about expectation versus reality. They're going to come to you with ha-ha jokes about, like, oh, my job's hard, just automate it. Um, you know, it can't be that difficult, right? Set, level set the expectations with them. This takes time. It takes iterations. I'm not going to be able there's no magic wand. I can't just make it all go away. Um, so make sure you level set those expectations going into it, just like any other product it takes development. So uh, in conclusion, uh, reach out. Find me on LinkedIn. Meet me up in the hall. I'll give you a business card. I want to collaborate with all of you guys. I mentioned I did a meetup in Chicago earlier. That was a great time. This is better when done together, honestly. So uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, thanks to Shri and the Cortex team. I mentioned they've been great partners. I really appreciate being here and being able to talk to you guys. It's been a great time. So with that, I don't know if there's time for questions, but yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Does anyone have questions for him? Yep. Oh. Yes. Hi. Uh, hi. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Gilad Shriki <laughs> from the Cortex team. I have a question. You mentioned you have, like, you're, you're owning the automation team and you have the other teams, and this is a great approach, but I wanted to get your feedback and experience on how this relation goes. How do you collect uh, the requirements? Did you see any, feed, any pushback of actually implementing different processes, different tools like the MISTO? Yeah, so the, the process so far has been pretty smooth on our end. We've got leadership that's very accepting of the direction and of the space. Uh, so, so far, we've been able to just justify, document, like any other agile delivery team would. Here's the, here's the ask, here are the you know, considerations, here are the capabilities and the risks, and move on from there. So, I mean, our features these days are developing a lot quicker, uh, because we were able to show, with the phishing use case, here's what it looks like. Here's how it works. Um, I, I've been consistently surprised, though, with the business's adaptation of this mindset, especially with that, uh, the checker for the credentials. We had to get an account that had write permissions to an identity service system. Uh, it only had write permissions to a single flag, and it's more heavily locked down than any other human could be. We're able to document it, track it via logs, create alerts. Uh, but I still expected some people maybe with some um, legacy-type thought processes surrounding compliance and things like that to be like, no way, 
too spooky, no thanks. Uh, but we've had great, great results so far in that space. Yeah. I guess we're asking all the questions. Um, <laughs> when you think about your journey, what was the hardest thing to wrap your head around uh, in the Demisto platform? So I think with the platform itself, the hardest thing to wrap our head around was the, the continuousness of the events driving themselves, right? You'd turn it on and you'd want to see the first, you know, phishing email get worked and you'd see it and that's great. And then the, a little bit of kind of anxiety would set in when it comes to like, okay, I, I haven't looked at it for like an hour. Is everything still good? Is it still working? Um, you know, what, what are my analysts doing? What's happening? Uh -huh. Yeah, giving, giving up control, it's different, but it does require a balance. So uh, we've, we've had it go wrong kind of in both directions, just sending something loose, saying we've had you know, great luck in these areas, let's turn this on, it's ready, and then you know, an hour later we get a page and it's like, okay, all right, yeah, maybe we moved a little too quick on that one. But we've also done the opposite, where you just kind of get into analysis paralysis on something and you refuse to give up control and it kind of delays or stifles that innovation. So I think it's something, though, that everybody's going to, it's kind of a cultural thing. It's kind of a change of culture in the industry that we're going to have to develop over time is how much we trust these types of processes. No. Awesome. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, just a quick question from me. Now that you've seen what you've seen and uh, automated some use cases, typically when looking at Cortex XOR, you think of phishing for the initial use case. Now that you've gone through a few use cases and built a suite, would you still go after phishing first, or would there be another use case that you might want to look at uh, in the beginning? Yeah, I, I think I'm a little biased towards this answer, but yes, I would. Um, you know, that's what motivated me to pursue automation as kind of like what I wanted my next uh, career kind of you know stance to be. Uh, but I think the other good thing that it does is it requires you to make so many more tools to put in your toolbox. Uh, a lot of it we got out of the box, which is great, because Demisto put a lot of time into making phishing a, a primary use case. But every organization does it so differently. They use different tools. They have different policies. And we were no exception. So by the time we were done with it, we kind of sent our SOC analysts loose on uh, playbook engineering, which we have them do kind of on their own, right? We'll help them with the automation development and the platform side. but. They then went to automate a couple of things outside of phishing that they realized we actually already have all of the uh, tools in our toolbox that we need to do this. So their next two use cases came like that, like lightning. Um, and I think that phishing is a, a unique example like that because it, you have to check URLs, IP addresses, server names, you know, all that kind of stuff, threat intelligence platform. So it forces you to connect to more systems. So I would say, yes, it's a good starting point. Uh, just don't limit yourself to those constraints moving forward. Okay, All right. round of applause, let's do it. <laughs>